I just want to underline that for me this is a very big subject and, uh, and uh, I have uh, been allocated 15 minutes for it and it's impossible to fully cover the technique we use in, in 15 minutes but for those of you who are 17. interested in sorry 17, you can get I get 17 perfect I'll take it slow then <laughs> so otherwise it's published uh, the technique that I use in clinics of plastic surgery in 2009 so for those of you who want to read up on it, it's there. Now I think it's very important if we're going to discuss mastopexy augmentation to first answer the question on, on uh, how to caress ptosis of the breast with implants uh, and mainly answering the question when do we have to use a mastopexy and when can we avoid it. And for many, many surgeons it's a little arbitrary decision making, but we can make it much more mathematical. Now, obviously when we see patients we know that there are severely different degrees of difficulties in decision making. So we have the patient on the left here, she has a full lower pole and she has very minimal skin excess. And that's a straightforward, simple case where anybody with a relatively arbitrary planning can get a good result. The patient on the, other, uh, on the right side here, however, she has a pseudototic breast with skin excess. And how do we deal with these patients? Now, the first thing we have to do is to answer the question, what about the vertical positioning of the implant on the chest wall? Which is very important, and that should be in relation to the nipperla complex. So very important principles for implant vertical height positioning uh, was something I looked a lot at in the 1990s and it's the foundation of what we call the academic clinic and method today. And the first principle there is that if we correctly perform the breast augmentation we actually get the true elevation of the nipperla complex. The second principle is that planning on the breast is not so good because the tissues are lax and it's always variable when it comes to the planning along the mid meridian of the, of the breast. So if we transfer the new nipple position or the nipple position to the midline by drawing a nipple to sternum line, this is a much better way to plan the procedure. So that's for me a very, very important line in our primary breast augmentation patients, but mastopexy augmentation and all, all planning procedures we do. And the third thing was that I looked at several hundred breast augmentation patients in the 90s and found that we can actually predict the nipple elevation after breast augmentation by arm elevation preoperatively. And the correct elevation is to put your hands on top of the head, which is a 45 degree elevation. So that's a very good way of predicting the new nipple position. If it's a lax breast or is it's a tight breast. So we go back to these patients. The principle for this planning is at arm elevation and then think about how much we want distal to the nipple projection point. Well, that's simple and straightforward. Whereas this patient is totally different. When she elevates her hand, we can see that the nipple is well above the nipple projection point, but it's still a very short lower pole here. Now, how should the implant be located in relation to the nipperla complex? This is just trying to depict the implant in a breast. This is an MM320 implant. And if we think about the nipple projection point on the ventral surface of the implant, the goal is to have approximately half of the
or I would have positioned it far distal to the existing inframammary fold. And if I position an implant distal to the submammary fold in a case like this, what happens? Well, first of all, in a case like this, I will have too much skin. But secondly, you will have a high risk for a double bubble deformity. Now, that is the first thing to consider when we answer if the mastopexy should be able to avoid or not. The second thing we have to answer is how much skin do we actually need in the lower pole of the breast? And this is something we mathematically can calculate. Because the amount of skin we need in the lower pole of a breast in a breast augmentation relates to where the nipple projects on the implant ventral surface if we want half of the implant distal and half of it proximal, then we have to consider what I call the lower ventral curvature of the implant. The amount of length we have from the nipple projection point to the lower border of the implant, the LVC value of the implant. And then we have to consider also the amount of gland the patient has, which is actually the difference between the purple and the red line here. Why the difference of the purple and the red line? Because if you empty the breast, make a subcutaneous mastectomy, basically this purple line comes in and therefore you want to know the difference between the red and the purple line. So amount of skin needed in relation to the implant depends on the implant base plate and the projection. So this small implant, 135 gram, that just has the lower ventral curvature of 6 centimeter. This big implant needs the double distance, 12 centimeter. And we have to think about it. And it's interesting that plastic surgery has been doing these procedures for 50 years without really considering it so much. The LVC values of, of implants can be calculated for si every single implant. Uh, just by measuring it on a piece of paper, I've done it for Allegon's implants, which uh, what we have mainly been used to use. Now, how much do we add for the gland, the difference between the red and the purple line? Well, I would say in a typical breast augmentation, it's about one to two centimeter. If you will make it really simple, you could add one and a half centimeter to the LVC value of the implant. Now, that's not the very accurate way. A better way is to take the central glandular pinch and divide it by two. But if we think of it in a mathematical way and triangular, uh, arithmetics it's not perfectly correct so actually what you want to know is the difference between the X and the Y here the question is how do you do that preoperatively which is your third alternative in planning how much you add to the LVC value and actually you have everything you need because you have already planned the implants in inferior border by arm elevation and then predicting how much you want distal to that projection point so you only have to ask the patient preoperatively to ask her to put her hands on top of the head and measure the convexity of the breast and what you subtract from that, the inside. And the inside is half the implant height, which is your third alternative. Now what is the importance of analyzing both the implant's vertical position and the amount of skin you need in the lower pole? Why do you have to think about both of these things? Because if this difference is more than two centimeters, then there's too much ptosis. You have to consider mastopexy. Or the implant is too small to fill the envelope. Perhaps you need more LVC value to really fill that envelope. Or reversely, if that line doesn't come above your oil P line, it comes distal, well then your tissue is too tight. The implant is too big for the envelope. That's why these two questions are so important to answer both in primary breast augmentation but also when you have patients with pseudototic situations. So when is the mastopexy indicated? Well usually in most cases where the nipple is well distal to the submammary fold. Uh, in many secondary cases with glandular atrophy, if it's going to change the implant and there is a f if you put the new implant, especially form stable implant, it will not fill that dead space. Many of these cases need some mastopexy. Could also be patient who expects and demands more nipple elevation or more upper pole filling than you can achieve with, for instance, a low height extra projecting implant. And obviously patient who desires reshaping of the nipperella complex. So what about mastopexy augmentation as a one stage procedure? Well, the advantage is obviously it's one has high patient acceptance. There is one hospitalization 
which is cheaper. But I think perhaps even more importantly is that the mastopexy is adjusted to the dimensions of the implant. That means we consider what the amount of skin we need in the lower pole at the time of the mastopexy. And if you see a lot of surgeons who actually advocate against mastopexy augmentation, especially a slightly bigger totic breast, and say that this should be executed very, very cautiously. Well-known surgeons like John Tebbe says, well, you, have to, you should be avoiding a big ptosis. Now, these surgeons really don't think about the fact when they do their mastopexy at the first stage, which is the most common, to consider what implant they're going to put back in this patient six months later. And that's something you actually should do if you do it as a two-stage procedure. Now, the disadvantage with one-stage procedures is there's an increased risk for healing problems. And a common reason for malpractice suits in many countries. In some countries, it's said to be in aesthetic surgery, the most common reason for malpractice. So it's more technically demanding. The preoperative planning on your surgical technique is crucial to get good results. And obviously, we see a lot of patients who come and say they don't want an inverted T, they don't want the mastopexy scar, they want only the scar in the submemory fold. And you have to be able to tell them if it's possible or not. And you have to avoid these type of poor results because this is a poorly executed inverted T technique in a mastopexy. Animation problem, muscle is not divided in the correct way by this surgeon, and the submemory fold scar is way too long. You don't need this long, this incision. If you create the small submemory fold incision and you suture it into the fold, this is the least conspicuous part of the scar. So the planning is very important. A correctly performed and planned inverted T or mastopexy the submemory fold scar is very short and it's sutured into the fold and it's basically inconspicuous, like this secondary side chain from subglandular to submuscular implant. Now, so in analogy with what I said, in, in, a, in, a, in a breast augmentation, the implant's vertical height should be adjusted on the thoracic wall in relation to where the nipple areola complex will end up. In a mastopexy augmentation, same principle, but we adjust the nipperola complex to the implant that we have selected. But same principles. So the same sort of planning, but with the big difference that we do it in a reversed fashion. So instead of planning how to position the implant lower pole, we use the inframemory fold as the starting point and then plan the nipple position. So the inframammary fold becomes the implant's lower pole. So we, how do we use this principle in a mastopexy augmentation? Um, yes, this patient is obviously very clear, very, very distally located uh, nipples. There is no, no chance that you can correct it with just implants. She needs definitely mastopexy augmentation. This is absolutely too far, for, too long for the, the time I have allocated, so I'll just speed it up. So basically what, what we do is, is to extend our inframammary fold to the midline uh, and then, this is just sort of the patient communication, I'll jump that. Uh, so what we extend the, the, uh, the uh, submammary fold to the midline and you can see this patient has a little bit of an asymmetry in her submammary fold. And therefore, I will lower the left submemory fold half a centimeter, and the right submemory fold I will elevate half a centimeter. So they come in equal height. Now, I have my implant height here, it's 11.6. So from the midline, approximately, I measure half the height of the implant, which is 5.8. <coughs> and then you have to extend the line from the sternum to the midline. Extremely important when you do that is to elevate your arms. If you don't elevate your arms, the nipple complex will be way too high. So you extend that new nipple position laterally. And usually if you have selected an implant that's quite accurate for the dimensions of the implant, then it will project relatively close to the existing submemory fold. Now when you have decided the new nipple position, you check it in relation to the submemory fold. It could be above if you have a little bigger implant. It could be slightly below or at it. And then check the distance from the sternum notch 
midclavicular line and from the midline when you plan exactly the position of the new nipple or complex. And obviously these, these nipple or complex are medialized, you want to lateralize them, therefore you sign out the meridian of the breast and that's where you reposition uh, your nipple or complex. Now, what type of technique should you use? Should you use a periareolar, inverted T, or should you use a vertical technique? Same principle can be used in all of these techniques. But that depends on the amount of skin you need in the lower pole, because you have to think about the LVC of the implant, the lower ventral curvature, and the amount of gland. And then you have to stretch the skin from the submammary fold approximately. Usually a periareolar technique is not a good technique in many cases because it flattens the neurolog complex and it gives a widening of the nipple I, I, I use it for small adjustment, but I try to avoid periolar mastopexy in most of my cases. I think it's overused. Vertical technique works very fine. The benefit of a small submarine fold incision is you can really emphasize it with your sutures, and you can also, when you do that, get extremely good access to your, uh, to your area. So we have first now decided where to position the nipple complex. Then we think about the amount of skin we need. We, re we mark the diameter we need. Usually I have about 13 centimeter circumference there. And then uh, we think about the amount of skin we need between the uh, areolar border and the submammary fold. And that here is related to the LVC value of the implant, 8.4 for this implant, plus the tissue cover, which is 1.4. So she needs 9.6 centimeter between the nipple and the submammary fold. Well, that's from the nipple. Now, you want to know the areolar to submammary fold distance, so you have to subtract what? Half the areolar diameter. That means I subtract <coughs> 2.2 approximately, or 2 centimeter, from my 9.4. That's the distance I meet with the areola and the submammary fold. And then I mark the midline, displace the breast medially and laterally, and then I just uh, ex if I need to, I take a little wedge or I can make a vertical. Same principles, very straightforward and safe way of doing it. So basically that's, that's the planning. Now how do you execute this procedure in a very good way? A very good way of executing it is to use your incision but don't burn any bridges. Start off like doing it a two-stage procedure which means that you want your implant in place first before you excise any skin. So the first thing I do is I incise my submarine fold incision and one of the vertical pillars. The benefit of one of the vertical pillars is I expose the whole pocket, especially if you have a secondary mastopexy augmentation. It's so easy to dig get access to that whole, whole uh, implant and the, the capsule if you're going to do a neosubmuscular pocket or something like that. Always protect the nipple or complex with tegaderm, so minimize contamination, local anesthetics. And then I use my submammary fold incision. I cut through part of the, part of the uh, vertical pillar, and I get extremely good access to my whole area without excising any skin. The other benefit of cutting into one of the vertical pillars is that you can really shape the breast by sutures before you resect any skin. So we do that and you get good access and obviously you can, uh, can make your, this as I said it's a little bit too long, so you can, you can do your submuscular dissection, uh, usually dual plane 2 technique, uh, leaving muscle distal to your nipple sternum line. Very important is to have enough muscle distal uh, to your nipple sternum line so you de don't get animation problem. You want the muscle to retract from the lateral part of the capsule however, so let that retract but keep it low in the midline. Okay, we skip that part, and before I put the implant, I use a uh, quill suture here, a uh, barb suture. I suture it uh, scarpa fascia to thoracic wall, and on the left, right side, I elevate the submarine fold, as I said, a little bit. On the other side, I lower it. So I, I suture along the lower border there, and then I take the lateral and medial pillars and put it to the midline. So it becomes like a vertical mastopexy, but with a small inverted T. And then I do the same thing on the other side, irrigate the pocket, change my gloves, minimize contamination, put the implant in place. And then I put everything together. So now it's a two-stage procedure because the implants are in place and then it's time to do the mastopexy, get the patient sitting up. So we always have these patients sleeping with arms along the side. 
and uh, and then we get the patient sitting and I uh, I do the same thing on the other side and very important for me is to check my markings with the patient sitting and I use staples to reposition see what everything is and then I just execute the mastopexy. Very safe way, no tension in the T-junction, three point closure. I think that's about as much as I have. Just examples here, obviously the same planning and technique can use, be used in imperial mastopexy like this tuberous breast or the vertical technique as in this case and the healing process there one week postoperatively and six month postoperatively vertical technique or exemplifying a patient who really don't want the big breast so this is a case where we could use a round device I use a TSL very low projecting implant just two centimeter to produce that long term upper pole roundness small reduction at the same time. So this is a small round implant. Or as here, there's a, a bigger breast on the one side, same implants on both sides, FX410, but reduction on the left side at the same time. So it can be not just a mastopic, it could also be a reduction. And this is the healing process uh, in a secondary case, one week after and then six months after where the scar is where it should be. Secondary mastopexy augmentation also. Breast augmentation in combination with mastopexy was performed uh, in 5% of our cases and with other procedures such as abdominoplasty here in 2% of cases. And obviously mastopexy augmentation can alone or in combination with other procedures result in dramatic changes in body image. Uh, the longevity and stability of these procedures is very good. This is six months postoperatively and then seven years later. So most of these patients has a long lasting result. Finally, uh, I would take the opportunity to hope that many of you will come to next year's BTS meeting. Uh, this was from this year. Uh, we had a very good response. You can go to the webpage uh, ak.se or beautythroughscience.com and hopefully be part of the 750 plastic surgeons that were there this year. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>